Welcome to Digital 360 Summit 2020. We are the premier event for senior executives driving industry digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization. 2020 edition is a free virtual event via Zoom. The dates are August 18th, 19th, and 20th, 2020, and August 25th, 26th, 27th, 2020. We want to thank our sponsors, Texas State University, Greater San Marcos Partnership, and Cedar. This year's edition has 70 speakers from amazing companies like NASA, Intel, SAP, CPS Energy, Brazos River Authority, Gatera, Direct Energy, City of Austin, Eclara, Dell, NG, Exelon, Oracle, Testra, General Motors, TXDOT, Bistra, Siemens, AT&T, National Grid, iTron, City of Los Angeles, Austin Energy, City of Colorado Springs, and Hunt Energy Network, and over 1,000 attendees. The program has 16 keynotes and 11 panels, followed by 11 white papers and 28 videos. The event covers multiple industry verticals, verticals like networks, energy and utilities, buildings and infrastructure, water and wastewater, public safety and new financial tools, smart cities, sensor and edge computing, big data and software, smart mobility, new regulations and business models, space and smart factory and industry 4.0. We are also introducing Texas State Cedar, a new industry research consortium focused on connected infrastructure research enabling big ideas and the topics covered in each of the panels. We at Texas State, Star Park, Cedar, the Greater San Marcos Partnership, and industry partners are focusing on building nine living labs to transform applied research and economic development with the goal to delivering one digital world. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we're live. Uh, welcome to Digital 360 Summit 2020. We have a fantastic lineup um, and we are excited uh, for the opportunity to reach out to you. Uh, and we see that uh, the attendee roster is coming in and folks are lining up. It usually takes a few minutes for everybody to come on. Um, we have a fantastic lineup, uh, as you all know, and I want to welcome uh, Dr. Walt Horton. Hello, Walt. Hello. I want to welcome Steve Frazier. Hi, Steve. Yes. I want to welcome Jason Giulietti. Jason. Uh, Jason is out from, for a moment, and I want to welcome uh, my uh, partner on Cedar, Dr. Stan McClellan. Hi, Stan. Hi, Andres. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for being here and joining us after so much preparation. I uh, want to welcome John Wellinghoff. Hi, John. Hey, Andres. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you, John. Glad you're here again. Uh, and obviously, last, last but not least, our inductee for the Digital 360 Summit Hall of Fame, Pat Wood. How are you, Pat? Hey, Andres. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for being here. So, so we have a, a, a full uh, time here. Uh, we may run over uh, for the hour and a half that we have scheduled a little bit. Uh, so hang tight. Uh, remember that you can uh, uh, use the chat function to, or the Q&A to send some questions. So as you're listening to the content piece, please feel free to start uh, sending questions over if you want to. Uh, so with that said, I am ready to ask Dr. Horton to uh, uh, lead uh, the uh, afternoon. And Dr. Horton is the Chief Research Officer and Associate Vice President for Research and Federal Relations at Texas State University. And we are super delighted to have him. And I, am, I call myself a lucky man because I get to work with him just about every day. <laughs> Walt? Andreas, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Digital 360 Summit. I, I'll just start by saying, you know, all of us at Texas State University, along with our friends at Greater San Marcos Partnership, CMG, CEDAR, uh, we are just so thrilled and honored to be sponsoring and, and hosting uh, this event. The only thing that would be better is if we could actually all be together um, here in uh, beautiful San Marcos, hot, but beautiful San Marcos, um, and maybe take a ride on the glass bottom boats over at Texas State. But uh, I wish all of you best where you are. I know you're all continuing to do amazing things, um, even as we deal with this very challenging time. So I'm gonna share my screen, Andreas, if that's okay. Absolutely. All right, let's make this technology work. That's what it's all about. 
Um, how's that? Is that going good? Perfect. Excellent. Well, I get the opportunity to spend just a few minutes uh, talking about an institution that I really love, Texas State University. I'm very privileged to be the chief research officer here at Texas State. Um, and I'm going to frame my comments just by posing a question. Um, and basically the question is, if you could kind of start all over and design uh, a perfect research university to educate the next generation workforce and focus on solving real world problems through cutting edge science, what would that university look like? Well, you might not be too surprised if I share an answer with you that I think it would actually look a lot like Texas State. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about some of the characteristics of Texas State and some of the approaches here we use that I think align actually really well with uh, the goals of this summit. And, and these are approaches that focus on um, driving innovation and creating breakthroughs and you know, creating a smart and inclusive world, um, which I think is a lot about what this summit is focused on. So Texas State, well, you know, we, we are big and uh, here on our main campus in San Marcos, um, it's a large uh, sort of state-of-the-art facility for education and research. But you know, we're not just based here in San Marcos. We actually have facilities um, all over the place. If, if you go north of Austin up to Round Rock, Texas, we have about 100 acres that we're building out as our health professions campus. Um, Willow Hall is our newest building out there. It's a state-of-the-art research and education facility in the, in the area of health professions. If you go just west of San Marcos, we have about 3,500 acres. That constitutes our Freeman Center. I mean, here in Texas, 3,500 acres is just a small spread, but we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty proud of it. Um, and it's where we carry out uh, cutting edge agricultural research, ranching, farming, and other innovation. Uh, it's one of our university level research centers. Um, we're actually, um, at least the, the rumor is that we're the only university, at least major university in the nation that owns the beginning of a major river. We are literally where the San Marcos River springs up out of the, um, the fault and, and begins to flow downstream on its way uh, to join the Guadalupe. So that beginning of the San Marcos River is actually one of our research facilities as well, the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment. And then of course Star Park, you're going to hear a lot more about Star Park. We're very proud of this um, innovative uh, incubator and much more. And, and you'll hear Steve and, and Stan and others talk about Star Park. But you know, one, as I was looking at this opportunity to come to Texas State a few years ago, um, and, and I've been at some pretty big places. I was at Eli Lilly working on a drug discovery team there in the area of arthritis. I had a chance to work about 10 years in the National Institutes of Health, you know, arguably the largest uh, biomedical research institute in the world. So I'm not easily impressed, but when I began to look at Texas State and see some of the characteristics of this university, it really caught my attention. Um, as I mentioned, we are large. We're, we're gonna have you know, somewhere around 39,000 students enrolled. It's gonna be a very different uh, mix of students this year as we open up literally this week. And, and you know, we, we think we're ready. We, we wanna bring those students back safely and give them a good educational experience. But it's not just about the number of students, it's about where those students come from. Over 50% of our students are ethnic minorities. Um, we are a federally designated Hispanic serving institution. Many of our students are first gen. They come from you know, very challenging backgrounds and, and they're really kind of special, their commitment and their drive to, um, to get their education and, and advance their, their lives. Um, we also have very compelling degree programs. Again, it's not just about the, the number of degree programs, it's, it's about how they're focused uh, I mean, for example, we have a relatively small portfolio of doctoral programs. The PhD programs, of course, are research-based, but there's a very strong application component, even in our doctoral programs. Our newest program is a PhD in applied computer science. We have a doctoral program in material science, engineering, and commercialization, very novel. 
Um, so we think we're, we have the right mix and we're always looking at, you know, what, what degrees should we be offering our students? Also, one of the unique aspects of Texas State is how multidisciplinary our R&D mission is. You rank in the top 50 in the nation in um, R&D in the humanities. Um, and so a lot of our research programs span disciplines, the STEM disciplines, the liberal arts, the humanities. Um, we rank in the top quartile nationally in total R&D expenditures. We're a Carnegie classified uh, research university at the R2 level. We have our sites set firmly on achieving that R1 status. About 80% of our total R&D funding comes from large federal sponsors. And much like I talk about the quality of our students, um, all of this is possible because of our world-class faculty. So it is a really unusual and compelling and powerful mix of um, characteristics at Texas State. I think that probably uh, Jason Gioletti, uh, CEO of Greater San Marcos Partnership, is going to talk more about this. But I just wanted to also frame it's not just about what we are or who we are. It's also where we are. Um, and, you know, we are located right in the heart of, you know, what may be the most active innovation area in the nation. You know, think of Research Triangle Park with its three research universities. Well, we don't have a triangle, but we have a corridor. If you go from Texas State to Round Rock, UT Austin, the main campus of Texas State, and then on down into San Antonio, there's over a quarter of a million students being educated in this corridor, millions of dollars of research funding, startup companies, and it's a magnet for you know companies to come and be a part of this. So we are proud and excited to be right in the middle of this innovation corridor. I hope I teed that up for you, Jason. I know you're going to say a lot more about that. Um, it's really hard to do justice, in a sense, to, uh, you know, what are our strengths at Texas State. Um, I think one of the characteristic themes of this, uh, of our portfolio of research, is the applied nature, or what we call research and innovation with relevance. These are some of, er some of our areas where we have a critical mass of uh, faculty, of education programs, of research funding. You can see just looking at any one of these um, that th there's a real application and, and applied component to these particular areas of research. Um, you also see here what some of our major, major federal sponsors are. So, you know, we talk about funding from National Science Foundation, Department of Education, National Endowment of Humanities. We have an over $10 million portfolio with NASA, National Institutes of Health. Um, this is Dr. McLean. He and his team, they put a project up on the space shuttle a few years back, and now they've got one slated to go up on SpaceX in October. So they're going to be studying biofilm formation on the International Space Station. So I think the point is when you're, when you're trying to address problems that have um, a real world application, it garners a lot of attention and partnership from, um, you know, some of the, the top federal sponsors out there. Um, I, you, you all probably remember Yogi Berra, you know, the catcher for the Yankees. I think he famously said that the future ain't what it used to be. Well, this is a little variation of that. And, uh, and I think it, it actually speaks a lot about what Texas State's all about, about what any major research university should be about. And that's creating a future. Um, whether it's through our students that we educate, the future workforce, or, or the research that we do. Um, we tend to see, much like what I showed you with the federal sponsors, there tends to be a lot of interest in the private sector in uh, partnering with Texas State because of this um, applied research portfolio. So many of the research programs that we have are sort of platform that, that span across multiple applications. I'll give you one example here. Uh, Larry Fulton's research in College of Health Administration He's um, focused on machine learning, artificial intelligence. So he does a lot of work looking at images of uh, brain scans and having his computer paradigms predict Alzheimer's progression. It turns out that the same exact approach is of interest to Ostunet, the parent company of Titleist and Footjoy. 
And so we flew out there a few months back and they're interested in using that same approach to predict the characteristics of golf ball flights or how well their golf shoes are gonna sell. So, you, you know, it's really this, this applied component of the research, it's, it's very interesting. I know um, Dr. McClellan is gonna speak. Uh, Stan's had a, a great role in developing a partnership with Jacobs Engineering, which has the main engineering contract with NASA. And um, they're very interested in Texas State because of our engineering prowess, but also because of our diversity um, focus. And, and they see the great value of bringing uh, diversity into the engineering workforce. So just two examples of how our research programs partner with the private sector. What I wanted to do just uh, in, in, for a very few minutes here is just put some names and faces with some of the research that we do, because I, I think this is really what tells the best story. Um, this is uh, Dr. Oleg uh, Komogorstev in the Department of Computer Science. Um, he's got a, an outstanding program in uh, eye tracking, human computer interaction. It's of great interest in the area of, of cybersecurity but it's also of great interest in the area of health and, and diagnosing certain health conditions. In that same department, computer science, um, we have Dr. Zilong Zong, uh, who is interested in green computing. And uh, I think Dr. Zong is, is gonna be speaking at one of the upcoming panels. So computer science is no, another one of our really high profile, very applied research departments at Texas State. Give you another example that's um, a, a little bit different than in the STEM disciplines. This is Dr. Ka Kathy Martinez Prather, who directs one of our um, university level research centers, the Texas School Safety Center. Now think about this, her mission is school safety, kindergarten through community college, every school district in Texas, public and private. That is a pretty compelling portfolio. And, and it's really important that this is a university-based research center because what she and her team does is use data and research to drive best practices for school safety. Not just the horrific events like school shootings, but nutrition, um, anti-bullying programs, smoking cessation. Um, she's got millions of dollars of federal funding linked to state appropriations to drive this mission. Also, you see our other university research centers. And again, to give you an idea, we, we don't create centers and institutes, you know, easily at Texas State. It, it, there's a high bar for creating these, and they all have this real strong um, applied mission. We also have centers and institutes at the unit level. Um, you're going to hear from Pete Blair, who leads our alert center, which is focused on training law enforcement and first responders in active shooting scenarios. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Davio, who runs our Institute for Government Innovation. Really fascinating because what they do is work with government agencies to increase their efficiency and their effectiveness, their policies and procedures. And so she does, you know, has a really strong portfolio linked with many state and federal agencies. Um, I'll show you just two more quick examples. Uh, Dr. Fred Aguayo, uh, you know, in our Department of Engineering Technology, Concrete Industry Management Program. Yes, we have an entire degree program in concrete at Texas State, and, and we're very proud of it. Um, this program is led by uh, Dr. James Wild, uh, who's also going to be on one of the upcoming panels. And, you know, it's just a fascinating program focused on, you know, producing a concrete material with a low carbon footprint and all the innovation that goes into testing materials and concrete. Um, and so they have concrete spread out all over central Texas, looking at its durability and characteristics in different situations. Also a great uh, education program for our students. Um, and the last example that I wanted to show you is uh, Dr. Shate Ashford. And we talk about this, this span of disciplines at Texas State. And, and, and you might have one research project that has scientists doing uh, epitaxy and, and developing novel layered materials. And on the same team have someone who's interested in the human material interface. And Dr. Ashford, we're very proud of her research, which is focused on diversifying the STEM workforce. And 
She looks at how do we bring students from non-traditional backgrounds? How do we work with community organizations, faith-based organizations, to get these folks interested and engaged in a degree, in a career in, in STEM education? Again, National Science Foundation funding and other major federal agencies interested in her work. So that was a quick flyby of Texas State University. And I think fundamentally, you know, what we talk a lot about at Texas State, and, and I think, you know, resonates with a lot of the themes of this conference is, you know, sometimes you got folks who have problems and they're looking for solutions. And sometimes you got folks who have solutions uh, that are looking for an application. And if we can just work hard to get those, those individuals together, that's where the innovation really happens. And that's pretty much how we spend our time at Texas State is trying to make that happen. And Andreas, with that, I am going to give up my screen. And once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to show off Texas State and, and lead off this conference. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing. I don't know if, um, if uh, uh, John or Jason or Pat uh, would like to ask any questions that come to mind, anything at all. If not, we can hold them back to the end. But if, if you feel compelled to ask a question for Dr. Horton right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I will say, if, if they do think of a question, that's great. But also, I want anyone out there to know that we are so ready to partner. So, uh, you know, if you have an idea or a thought about partnering with us, please reach out. Um, we're, we're ready to go. All oh, right. well, Stan, thank you. He gave me a, a thumbs up <laughs> for a good presentation. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. <laughs> All right. Well, let me let me move on then and uh, introduce you to Steve Fraser, who is the executive director of Star Park, and also the co-director of the Materials Applying Applications and uh, uh, Science Center um, at Texas State, and uh, he uh, is going to share uh, about Tex uh, Star Park right now. And obviously, um, he works very closely with. Dr. Horton and the team in driving the vision. So Stan, you would like to share your screen and uh, take us away? Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this today. And, and let me preface my remarks by saying none of what we're going to talk about would be possible if it weren't for a solid research foundation and even more importantly than that a culture of engagement you know dr horton talked about applied research we do basic research public universities do that but we go beyond that unlike a lot of universities and say how do we make this meaningful for society and not just a fulfillment of, of uh, curiosity that is very necessary. So Star Park, we are the only functioning research park in the state of Texas. We're one of about 700 that are found worldwide. And since we're unique in the state, first question has got to be, what's a research park? And the answer is that it is the university, but it's not campus. It has a real estate element, but it's not driven by a cash return on real estate. So what is it? Public universities have three basic core functions. We teach people and enlighten them. We do research and discovery. And then we do outreach or extension, uh, depending upon whether you're a land grant or not. And what all of that means is how do we interact and make a difference in the world? Star Park and a research park here is a very visible commitment by the university to outreach and economic development. It's a visible expression of uh, a need for success, which impacts the community's self-image as well as the image of the university. It's something we can drive by every day and see the connection between a knowledge-driven economy and opportunities for careers in the future. And most importantly, and this is the most important, for its long-term success, it's a community of knowledge growing through aggregation, and eventually attaining a critical mass which attracts other knowledge-driven companies. While the provost and Dr. Horton remind me on occasion they'd like me to at least cover the bills, 
Our real return is measured in other factors. Enhanced and accelerated product development and launches. Increases in company formation and growth. Diversification of the regional economy and creation of a link which enables the development of a meaningful talent pipeline. So what's our mission? Basically our mission as the park is to have a meaningful influence on the region's economic future. And our aspirational goal is to create an international connection bringing the best technology companies in the world to the innovation corridor. So all that sounds good, what's it mean? How do you get people into the park and what allows them to be here? Star Park's general criteria for entrance are typically it will be a for-profit enterprise that is trying to take a unique product, process, or service to market. Or it can be an outside agency or nonprofit institution that wants a physical presence here to collaborate with Texas State University. And finally, they're going to be engaged on site through applied research and development, demonstration projects, prototyping, pilot production, engineering, and product testing. Our business model as a park is to start with an incubator, grow and graduate companies, slowly begin to populate and become an attractor. So for the incubator, in addition to the general requirements for how to get into Star Park, we're looking for companies that are capable of scaling, and when we say that, we mean not uh, creating a lifestyle company. There's nothing wrong with that, but given the amount of resources we put into play, we want to, to foster companies that will have a, a fairly significant and noticeable impact on the region and the country. They need to be capable of launching within three to five years. And, and we say three to five because of the orientation we've taken with our incubator. If we were doing software, we would need to graduate you about every six months. Because if you're not making money in software in six months, you're not going to be somebody beat you to market. We're dealing with folks who are dealing with applications of chemistry and materials and life science applications and devices. And it takes three to five years to go from, I have an idea, to I've got a pilot product and a prototype I can take out to market. The core management team needs to be largely in place and they need to be able to benefit from the environment of an incubator where they're surrounded by like-minded companies dealing with the same kinds of issues that they're gonna to have to face as a startup. So fundamentally, an incubator like ours is addressing that valley of death from the inception where you run through all of the cash you've got on hand to where you actually begin to have revenues from sales and, and interaction with the marketplace. So how do we do that? We provide specialized facilities. We went to a concept of individual laboratory suites that companies can go into and grow from. The cost of fitting one of those out with, without equipment is about a half a million dollars. That is a huge hurdle for any startup company to try to address. We're doing that over a meaningful life of the facility. They're given access to core facilities on campus, they're given connections to faculty through research agreements and consultancies. Probably most important for attracting folks, access to students, that talent pipeline that's gonna allow them to grow their company more successfully. Access to paid uh, entrepreneurs in residence, folks who have been there, done that, and can sit down on an on-call basis to provide uh, sage advice to the company as they, they hit the hurdles that they'll have. Programming on site to provide them interaction with other growth companies and introduction to capital resources. So here's Star Park. We are, if you can see my, my cursor, sitting, I am sitting right here in the incubator. We have a total of 58 acres. We're located approximately three miles south of the main campus in San Marcos. And we are in the heart of the innovation corridor. We are almost exactly equidistant between the Austin and San Antonio airports. At build out, the park will have somewhere between 600 and 700,000 gross square feet of engineering, laboratory, prototyping, pilot production, and testing space. By design, the park is going to be high density. There are a lot of very credible studies out there that say if, if 
two researchers are located more than a five minute walk apart from each other, they might as well be across the country. By creating the opportunities for collision, by creating the programs and the amenities that draw folks together, that's where we're gonna see synergy happen. And we're going to have things occur that would not have happened otherwise. Admittedly, COVID-19 is going to present a challenge of how do we execute that? But I'm also confident we're gonna reach a point in the foreseeable future where we can address that and we can provide that platform for folks to be able to work. At full employment, which is about 20 years out, we're gonna have between 1,500 and 2,000 people working here in the park. That will have a marked influence on the character of San Marcos, on the character of Hayes County, and on its contribution to the overall uh, innovation corridor. If you don't think Texas State is committed, we have to date spent in excess of $50 million of, of university funds to launch this park. We've uh, pulled in an additional 2.3 million from federal grants and from grants from the city of San Marcos. We have today three buildings in place. We have the incubator, Star One. We have the Archive Research Center, and we will soon have the Infrastructure Research Lab. Star One, our incubator at 36,000 square feet, is the largest, let me repeat that, because in Texas it makes a difference. We're the largest laboratory-based incubator in the state of Texas. We are doing things other people aren't willing to do because we saw the need to address a market. When I came on board about eight years ago, we looked around and there were between 40 and 45 incubator, accelerator, co-working spaces between Austin and San Antonio, almost exclusively doing software. And the reason for that is capital investment. Good connectivity, four walls and programming, and you're up and running with a software incubator. We said, why do we want to be the 46th? Let's make the commitment to build something that creates tangible products that have a lasting impact uh, and become platforms for the future. And so that's what we did. We started out with 14,000 square feet. We've expanded this incubator twice in the time uh, I've been here. The ARC is not just an archive, it also has a research component where folks can come in and actually go through our rare collections and do research. And IRL, the Infrastructure Research Lab, which is planned for opening in mid-2022, we're in design phase right now, is going to enable us to do a technology enhanced approach to civil engineering, not your father's civil engineering. This will be a multidisciplinary approach that allows folks to come in, partner with us, and do meaningful applied research and demonstration projects in conjunction with the faculty and students at Texas State. So what have we done today? Well, just our incubator, we have today about 52 employees. I will tell you, we took a hit with COVID. Nobody closed, but we had a dramatic reduction in employment. What makes me feel positive about the strategy we're taking is we refilled all of that empty space and made up two thirds of the employment loss in 90 days. There is in fact an increased interest in entrepreneurship. And what I would attribute that to, and in talking to my counterparts around North America, they're all seeing the same thing. With this environment of uncertainty, people are saying, if I'm gonna take a chance to start something, now's the time to do it because I haven't got anything to lose. I'm gonna take a thoughtful approach, I'm gonna take advantage of the opportunities, and I'm gonna launch into the marketplace. The environment here is one where we try to grow companies, we get them to interact, I'm not so, hung up on myself that I think I'm the primary value add. The value add is having these companies together, providing the programs so they know each other, they interact with each other, and they're capable of doing more than they could have individually. Today, we have a dozen companies in residence. We've graduated three. Um, those companies, this is one of those returns on investment, have spent a little over one and a half million dollars in funded research back to Texas State. Uh, they've raised over $30 million. They, they're getting patents issued. Part of what is a great story for us to tell in a very competitive, competitive environment, how do we attract the best quality student to Texas State? Well, we say, look, we've got a functioning research park with startup companies where you can get it on the ground floor and you can be more than a person in a cubicle someplace else. You can actually help direct yourself 
to a career of the future. So over 17 of our, uh, our people who work out here are Texas State grads who started out as student workers and got hired by the companies. Another part of what we do here, uh, I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to be a co-director with Dr. Thomas Myers of something called Materials Application Research Center, or MARC. It is a special line item appropriation from the, uh, the unit, excuse me, the legislature. And what it does is a number of things, but what's key to today's discussion is it created an in-house innovation lab. It created the position of innovator in residence. Lots of folks have entrepreneurs in residence. We said, let's go find a disruptor. Let's find somebody who can take a look at what we can do. And if we don't like what, what they say, let's get rid of them, bring another one in. No, it's, that, that's being a bit facetious. But we did a search looking for someone with national and international credentials who could take an objective look at Texas State. And they were asked to do three things. First of all, identify existing and emerging areas of strength at the university. Secondly, position those areas of strength so that we could build on something that was not a me too, but allowed us to position ourselves to become a national and international leader in those technology and, and research areas. To identify the short-term strategies for collaboration, not just internally within the university, but by name, who are the companies we ought to be talking to short-term become partners with us. And finally, to recommend long-term strategies, including strategic future university investments that would sustain that growth and move us forward, uh, propelling us into a leadership role. Uh, despite the fact he's on this call, I will say we were very fortunate in being able to get Andreas Cavallo to join us as that IRR. In fact, he did such a good job uh, in that first year uh, as a consultant that we hired him. He is now faculty of record, and he is also co-director of CEDAR, which you're gonna hear about in a little bit uh, as one of our primary new initiatives at the university. Texas State has now moved forward to where we're taking that 58 acres, we're taking that 700,000 square feet, and we're saying we're gonna commit ourselves to making that entire proposition a living laboratory. Not just real estate, not just sterile buildings and streets, but things that have from their inception elements that allow us to do meaningful applied research, meaningful demonstration projects, and probably most importantly, meaningful experiential learning opportunities for our students. So CEDAR is a method of achieving that goal, and that's what I'm gonna hand off to uh, Dr. McClellan and Dr. Carvalho uh, to follow up with in the next segment of today. All right, thank you, Steve. Actually, we're gonna take a quick detour, um, and, uh, but that was fantastic and we, we, uh, we appreciate the detail. Uh, we, we are lucky to have uh, Jason Guglietti, who's the president of uh, Redis and Marco's uh, partnership with us, and uh, they are a sponsor as well. And we work very closely with them. And, uh, and we, uh, we wanted the opportunity for for Jason to share what is going on in that corridor and really help you all understand the immense opportunity as the population grows from some 6 million to 20 million people over the next 40 years. So Jason. Thank you, you very much, Andreas. Let me uh, share my screen here. Excellent. Excellent, please do. All right, so. One second to get that screen up and running for us. Excellent. Well, thank you all and, and thank you very much for the inclusion and the opportunity to join you today. Uh, certainly uh, welcome the opportunity. I mean, I, I simply want to start with economic development is a team sport. And I will tell you, we cannot have a better partner than Texas State University in that endeavor. So we very much value and appreciate the incredible relationship that we as an organization being now at our 10th year have with an institutional member like Texas State that has been with us since the beginning and has not wavered in the slightest uh, as it relates to supporting economic development and our efforts to grow this part of Texas and, and essentially Texas and the United States. So thank you for the opportunity, Andreas and, and team at Texas State. So with that, 
I'll share briefly, we at the Greater San Marcos Partnership are a public-private partnership. We are an economic development organization that is based here in San Marcos, but represent the Texas Innovation Corridor and representing the two counties that are made up in between San Antonio and Austin. We are founded and our mission really is to enhance and diversify our regional economy. We do that by facilitating business investment into our region and the creation of high quality jobs for our residents, ensuring that the quality of life and the economic opportunity of those that live here is better than it was yesterday and doing all we can to support that mission. Our organization has been around, as I mentioned, for 10 years. During that time, we've been able to secure more than 6,500 jobs for those residents that live here in our community. And that has equated out to more than $600 million in capital expenditures in this region as a result of the efforts of the partnership. We've also been able to accomplish an annual input into our economic situation of more than $2 billion of economic output on an annual basis that's been created by the work of the partnership over that last 10 years. As I share, it's not one organization or one individual or one team, it is a team effort and it, and it definitely has been kudos to Texas State and others in the community that have helped us get there. I will share we are an organization of professionals, a team of eight that primarily spend our time on three critical areas. That is business attraction, looking to attract companies to our region to leverage the amazing assets of Texas State and other key things we have in our region. We also have a business retention, expansion, and workforce component. Obviously, it's great to bring the companies here, but if we can't keep them happy, it's not, it's not going to be to our detriment that they then leave because of that. We also have a dedication and effort to workforce, really ensuring that the workforce needs of our businesses is met, both in our existing folks, but also the future. And that's where Texas State obviously plays another critical role. We also have a very aggressive marketing function. That marketing function, if you can't tell your story and folks don't know who you are, you are not gonna be viewed as a location for a company to find as a future home or future expansion for their efforts. So this relationship and what we have in our, in our collaboration with Texas State and our efforts in economic development are critical to ensuring our future success. So as I shared a little bit, really briefly sharing with you on the screen, what area we represent we represent that area between Austin and San Antonio here in Central Texas. That comprises of Hayes and Caldwell County. San Marcos is right there at the epicenter in the county seat for Hayes County. Uh, it is strategically located, as we mentioned, and I'll share more about that innovation corridor. But what's an, important to highlight is the fact that Hayes County has a, uh, with a populate, any county in the country with a population of more than 150,000, Hayes County is actually the fastest growing county in the country. So it is a destination for businesses and individuals looking to better their quality of life. So we know that we are continuing to see amazing, amazing growth uh, in our region, just purely in population numbers, but certainly as businesses continue to find our location as a destination, it's continuing to enhance our growth. The city of San Marcos in 2013, 14, and 15 was rated the fastest growing community in the country. So we've slipped a little bit to actually some of our neighbors, <laughs> but certainly San Marcos continues to be a, an attractive place for students, businesses, and individuals to come alongside the, the many beautiful communities in our footprint. I think what also makes our region incredibly attractive to those that are on this call, those that are interested in coming to our region and collaborating is the diversity of what we have to offer from some of the amazing communities like Dripping Springs, uh, Buda, just south of Austin, uh, Kyle, an amazing destination right now for industry, to Caldwell County, which brings an amazing uh, diverse uh, side of a, of a location in that connectivity between Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, major highways, uh, major interactive points where your company can locate and be within literally 20 minutes of the Austin International Airport or head 40 minutes south and be in the, at the San Antonio International Airport. So amazing, amazing opportunities. We also have been rated in many magazines, Fortune and other magazines and Forbes around the country for being one of the coolest small towns, greatest places to retire. So we're not only a community that caters to one or two audiences, 
We cater to a diverse group of individuals that make up our community. And ultimately what that means is we've been able to evaluate the data and brand ourselves the Texas Innovation Corridor. I'm gonna take a quick second and share with you kind of what drives us and, and what we do as an organization and why that's important, especially as it relates to those attendees here with the Digital 360 event and the efforts being put forward by Texas State. Our organization is driven by strategy. Those strategies have been defined to certain industry segments. Industry segments we know that are growing in the corridor, growing in Texas and growing in the United States. And that really is taking the approach of what you see on the screen. But not only these industries, but we're trying to attract the disruptors. We're trying to attract the innovators, those that are really pushing the boundaries of those traditional industry segments with the next generation of their product or their offering. So we're really driven by that advantage that is making it very attractive for companies to come to our region and find it an incredibly affordable place, an incredibly strategic location. Can't underscore that enough, that location between two of the fastest growing cities in the country converging on itself with San Marcos right here at the EFA Center will be one of the largest mega regions in the country in the future. As Andreas mentioned, the population alone is going to necessitate an amazing uh, level of investment to support that growth. And that's where we're excited about offering business opportunity for our businesses interested here, but also those looking to grow. So with that, I want to share a little bit more about the Texas Innovation Corridor. It's by no accident we developed this brand several years ago in collaboration and driven really with the university's success. But we've, we've taken the assets and those key major higher education institutions in University of Texas, in University of Texas San Antonio, and Texas State University at the epicenter, and discovered that in light of their efforts and in light of the innovation happening in our corridor, we have 11 times the number of patents being filed in our region than that of the, of the United States and nine times more than that, of, uh, so, pardon me, 11 times more that of Texas and nine times more that of the United States. So it is amazing the amount of activity happening in our corridor and know that we are on the precipice of really being synonymous with those regions like the Research Triangle, like Silicon Valley, but we're at the right time. We are peaking at a time here where we can capitalize on the next generation of what's happening in our communities and what's happening globally. Some examples of what we've been able to do is become a home, a second home, quite honestly, for Amazon. In all things as it relates to their growth, they have almost two plus million square feet of space residing here in our footprint and growing every day. We have companies like Urban Mining that are doing rare earth minerals. They're the only US based company in the world doing rare earth minerals and doing it in an amazingly innovative way. We have companies like Visionary Fibers that have uh, sprung out of Texas State University that are now up and running and operational at a significant level. Companies like Smile Direct Club doing things that are transforming the industry and bringing forward ideas that otherwise would have been looked at as archaic a long time ago, but bringing forward now new ways to do it and doing it in a way that's disrupting the industry. And most recently, of course, having uh, being now the new home of Tesla and their creation of their next generation of smart vehicle. Amazing opportunity for us and, and really the opportunity for us going forward. These are just scratching the surface of what we've been able to achieve over the last couple of years. But really what I want to share is really the fact that, again, our strategic location for those on, on this meeting and those joining us for this conference, knowing that really what we're surrounded by in the, the cybersecurity industry to our south in San Antonio and the software going on and that being provided up in the Austin space, our area in between those two cities is destined to take on the application of those two areas of software into hardware. We're going to be that home of where these products are produced. We're going to be the home of where the next generation of all of that great work is going to be brought into smart technology, smart homes, smart vehicles. And Texas State is being <laughs> incredibly proactive to lead the effort to ensure we're thinking about it the right way. And we're very excited to partner with them on that opportunity. And last, I wanna, I wanna just share sort of the importance of the collaboration with Texas State. We in economic development know that there's so many things that go into uh, getting a company to invest in a region or grow in a region. And one of the most critical pieces is collaborating with a major university. That is where you find the talent, 
you make sure your product stays cutting edge and essentially get transforms into two markets ahead of where you are now. And we're excited to, to be in that business of collaborating with Texas State. As the two previous presentations mentioned that Dr. Horton and Dr. Frazier, two incredible partners who talk the talk and walk the walk from what they said, I can tell you firsthand from having several businesses get to interact with them and their great faculty over at Texas State, it is what, he, what they shared. It is transformative and it is a differentiator for businesses coming to our region to know there is a true partnership there that is doing applied research that will transform their product and spring out new products that will help them grow into the future. So it is that leverage of collaboration, leverage of resources, both in faculty and research, alongside with the students, right? Your next generation workforce needs to come from somewhere and they're producing students who will roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty and do all it takes to really make the innovation corridor what it is. So I share that success. I share this message that we're excited about this continued collaboration and certainly here for anybody on the meeting today and certainly throughout the conference that is interested in forming a, a business opportunity here in our region, wanting to be closer to all the great things happening at Steve's shop at Star Park or be right in the middle of it with Texas State and Star Park in our region. We're here, we're willing to help and do what all it takes to, to bring your business here and help you in the future. So Andreas, thank you very much for the opportunity for us to, to share that message. And thank you and everybody on the call for the collaboration and the continued partnership and economic development. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for sharing fantastic uh, insights into what's going on at Texas State. We are delighted to have you. And uh, we definitely keep looking forward to our relationship. Now, let me, uh, before we get to the sizzle of the evening, if you will, let me uh, share quickly this opportunity called CEDAR uh, that you have heard about, which is basically our accelerator uh, uh, in terms of a business model to make all these things that you have heard come to fruition at a faster pace. Hopefully you all can see my slides, yes? I take that as a yes. Um, so what we have here at, at, at Texas State, as um, Steve was alluding to, it's a lot of work that went on for about two years to create a strategy on how we accelerate the assets and, and the sort of the, 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 the vision and, and the thrust that the university has been building over the last 20 years and accelerating really the last seven uh, years. And we uh, have basically created uh, a new style of research uh, using an industry uh, consortium um, footprint, if you will. And we call it CEDAR. Uh, CEDAR stands for Connected Infrastructure for Education, Demonstration and Applied Research. And if you, anything you want to remember out of that long acronym is really Connected Infrastructure. Uh, and so with CEDAR, um, we are hoping that we can share with you real quick, Dr. McClellan and I, what is CEDAR? Uh, what is the consortium about? Uh, him and I will uh, sort of go back and forth uh, on a few slides here and help you understand what this is about. Now, it all began with benchmarking what's being done in other large universities across the nation. And we decided that we could actually have a unique proposition and make uh, Texas State a global player uh, in industry research, uh, starting obviously with a you know, crawl, walk, run a strategy, but very quickly, given what you've heard in terms of what's happening in the region, we would be up and running. So we have already research, uh, reached out to a significant number of companies. So let me show you real quick a video that would um, highlight uh, what we do here. Uh, and uh, show you uh, just briefly what we're about.
can't see the video. Oh, really? Put your slides in presentation mode. Oh, I know why. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me stop sharing. My bad, my bad. My bad, my bad, my bad. It was bound to happen at some point. Here we go. Here we go. I can do it. <clears throat> can you see that? Here we go. Yay. You got it. So, so basically, you know, now that you have seen that, hopefully uh, that will pop some uh, ideas in your head about what uh, CEDAR is. And if you have any questions, that would be fantastic. Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. It's so not in presentation mode. Oh, yes, right. So thank you. So, so basically, uh, the key thing here is these nine living labs. And so we are creating something that is different. And as Steve mentioned, uh, the concept is that there are all kinds of labs where you can do standing research, you know, in a, in a sort of a control environment, if you will. And the concept here is actually the opposite of that in terms of being taking advantage of the entire park, so the 58 acres, uh, and the 600,000 square feet and the multiple buildings, if you will, and all the research that is gonna be going on. And, and think of it as a living organism, sort of a, a mini smart city, a smart neighborhood as, as our provost calls it. And, and so all these labs are gonna be designed uh, from the sort of the construction point of view and, and their, their sort of a sustainability concept, they're gonna be zero energy uh, zero water, zero waste, and focus on these nine areas. So the, the, the underlying uh, technology behind all this is something that we created called Technology Enhanced Infrastructure. And it's really as you follow the bubbles starting on the yellow in the center, you can put in there any kind of technology. And then as you take that technology into a digital paradigm, you need to create some kind of sensor, some kind of connectivity, and now you're tracking or measuring or monitoring or controlling something about that piece of infrastructure. And then- Andres, Andres, I'm not seeing the slides in presentation mode. Do you have them on a different monitor or something? Uh, there we go. That's better. It's still that presentation mode. Okay, well, can, can we just keep them here? Because I, I'm, I'm not so sure what's happening, so. Can you see yeah. that? Okay. So, so the, so the technology has infrastructure concept applies to any piece of infrastructure. And the idea is that we are going to really focus on working with industry on how we accelerate sort of the reinvention of everything as we know it, you know, buildings, windows, cars, sidewalks, uh, beams, uh, chairs, uh, all kinds of devices, you know, and, and so the, the concept here is, is really accelerate how we uh, take uh, current technology, current uh, path of innovation, and turn it into a digital paradigm by adding uh, connectivity sensors, uh, data gathering, database analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, machine learning. Uh, the, the, the CEDAR location is Star Park. So again, our consortium 
is just built on top of all the work that um, Steve and team have been doing for a long time in, in terms of building a physical location. And our consortium is just a mechanism on how you come and um, engage with the university to bring your ideas at a faster pace into market. Uh, so um, I don't know, uh, Stan, if you want to share anything before we get into the milestones on uh, on the location and on the concept of the technology itself. Well, I think I, I think the some of the other concepts that were mentioned previously about uh, workforce development are really applicable here. Uh, the fact that we're in the, the fastest one of the fastest growing segments of the United States. Uh, and the majority of the population growth in this segment is highly diverse. Uh, I think that's a huge that's a huge piece that needs to be dealt with here. You're talking about in situ uh, development, uh, deployment, and learning opportunities for the next generation workforce, which is huge. Right, right. And so, you know, the the, the quickly on the milestones again. You know, if you if you have uh, if you're in the audience and you have any questions about it please feel free to shoot some questions. But on the milestones, very quickly, you know, we're sort of open for business. We have a membership kit available. We have been already um, conversing with some 40 institutions that have, we have been talking to over about a year and a half. And we are in the process of engagement and onboarding. Uh, as uh, Steve mentioned, we are in the design phases of the Infrastructure Research Lab. And a lot of how we envision the part functioning uh, in terms of technologies and capabilities and what CEDAR will bring is part of the opportunity as a founding member, as a general member, or even an associate member and getting on board early on will give you the unique opportunity of an sort of a, in the VIP behind this the backstage tour of have the influence of how this whole place is going to evolve and, and be built. And so, um, and then we are, you know, um, launching the whole opportunity aggressively uh, here at, uh, at the Digital 360 Summit over the next six days. Uh, uh, this week, the first, you know, today, tomorrow, and Thursday, and then next week, the same 25th, 26th, 27th. And the focus short term, even though we have a long term of nine living labs. It's uh, four labs, one focus on smart utilities, another focal, focus on smart networks, uh, the IRL, which is the uh, focal point of smart buildings and infrastructure, and last but not least, uh, a lab on smart mobility. Any, any, any thoughts or comments on, on, on those, uh, Stan? Well, I think, I think one thing that needs to be discussed here is the genesis of the Infrastructure Research Lab, which is not just civil engineering. We heard a little bit about that from uh, Dr. Horton's presentation, but as time goes on, uh, the integration of electrical and communication and computer technologies into every part of modern life uh, is never ending. And uh, civil engineering and mechanical engineering are undergoing some pretty massive uh, the dis those disciplines are undergoing some pretty massive shifts uh, as these changes take place, like we saw in the telecommunications industry uh, 15, 20 years ago, and as we saw in the, we're continuing to see in the ener energy industry. And so the in Infrastructure Research Lab is an implementation, uh, uh, a physical manifestation of those changes that are going on in the discipline of civil engineering primarily. And uh, that's, that's, uh, when you couple that with the engagement in the next generation workforce, it's uh, it's it's phenomenal the power that that's going to have. Yeah, yeah. And so here's a snapshot of uh, what's going on with IRL. It's for real. The 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 design. These are some sketches of, of what's being designed. And and again, as I mentioned earlier, the the goal long term is that these buildings are being preconceived and wired and built up to be achieve zero energy, zero water, zero waste, and the, and the park itself will have the opportunity of being an energy microgrid, a telecommunications microgrid, a water microgrid, a wastewater microgrid of sorts. Um, and uh, on the conference, obviously you already saw some of the logos of the companies that there are speaking. 
and we are delighted and honored to have them all be part of this journey with us. Uh, and then in particular, uh, I wanted to just dive real quick on some of the, share some of the ideas. So just when you think about, um, you know, the four labs, we're talking about some of the key projects that are bubbling up to the top are things like building the substation of the future, uh, delivering uh, a new type of solid state intelligent transformers, building the concept of a one megawatt wind solar energy storage power plant uh, concept. Uh, as, as, uh, as you continue down the line of, of how these four labs interact with each other, the whole concept of a 48 volt DC wire home and building. Uh, another uh, interesting project is the notion of a 24 seven solar storage fuel cell uh, uh, power plant. Uh, and even the notion of uh, 5,000 embedded wireless sensors in a 30,000 square foot building and what that looks like. Uh, no, not to be short on any of that when it comes to mobility, the notion of um, building uh, autonomous traffic management systems that would leverage what's going on between uh, the corridor and using I-35 in our campus in Round Rock, in our campus in San Marcos, and obviously our uh, 58 acres in Star Park, uh, which is a 96 mile loop. Uh, the notion of working with, uh, um, uh, you know, a campus microgrid uh, enabling electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging uh, within the park. Uh, the notion of making sure that, you know, we're leveraging all kinds of communication technologies like 5G or uh, 4G or things like LoRa or low power wireless uh, uh, networks technologies for narrow band. Uh, and so we see really uh, an enabling and high level capability of what we can do in this living space. And, and so I like so many things about it and Stan and I talk about it, but Stan, any, any couple of things that come to mind in terms of what you wanna share some of uh, the projects and the ideas that we have been uh, collaborating with some of our partners? Yeah, there have been a number of projects that have been going on, some of which actually predate the, the formation of the consortium, which kind of uh, contributed to this general concept. Uh, for several years, there have been people at Texas State that have been working on next generation solar cells, that have been working on energy harvesting uh, uh, projects. There's a company at Star Park uh, that's, that, that's been working on energy harvesting uh, for several years very successfully. Uh, as well as uh, a number of other a number of other projects like that, uh, the presence of the largest molecular beam epitaxy system uh, and the most uh, diverse in terms of number of chambers MBE system uh, in the United States is one of the things that's driving many of those uh, many of those things. Uh, I think the, the 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 main concept that 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 you get here is uh, soup to nuts. Every time, every time I've participated in a in a discussion like this, the same thing jumps back to my mind, which is soup to nuts. You start, uh, and, and regardless of the dimension, you start from one end and you span to the other end. Uh, yeah. You start from the nano scale and you span all the way to the macro scale. Right? You start from one dimen one one extreme of one dimension and you span to the other extreme of the other dimension. That's the whole concept here. Yeah. And it doesn't just it doesn't just involve the workforce of the future. It's the workforce of the present as well. There's going to have to be a lot of retraining that has to go on. So there's a training facility at Star Park. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and so, again, we are open for business today. We are going to accelerate the Smart Networks Lab and the coming of 5G licenses and telecom technologies to start doing some validation and evaluation of technologies. Uh, so we really don't have to wait for all the living labs to be built to get going. Uh, we have on, today on, on campus some 32 labs uh, where we are already some 100 plus faculty working on 293 projects uh, related to this uh, focus that the CEDAR uh, labs have. And, uh, and, and furthermore, uh, the university has a big, big, big push on five big ideas that include things like uh, materials with intelligence and uh, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, and translational health 
and uh, big data uh, and the like, uh, AR, VR technologies, and which are big, big drivers uh, to how the focal point of uh, the researchers, the, 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 the funding, the faculty, the teaching, all coalesces. And so CEDAR is again a, a, a mechanism, if you will, on how all this push that the university is making come to fruition as it relates to working with industry in an accelerated fashion. So I don't know if there are uh, any questions. Uh, I see a bunch of questions, probably have to um, take a look at what some of those, but let, let, me, let me pause here and really switch gears uh, because I think that it's really important that we take time now to um, really uh, recognize uh, Pat Wood. And uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, him and John Wellinghoff for being so patient and listening to all of us uh, talk about what we're doing at Texas State. And I wanted to switch to John real quick um, and um, let John um, kind of uh, relax, switch gears, uh, get into pitching mode. Uh, and I, I have a video queued up, John, whenever you want me to. But if you will, please uh, uh, take the microphone from me and uh, take it away. I will do that, Andreas. Thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, you and CMG and the uh, Texas State University as well and uh, CEDAR, of course, and uh, the Greater San Marcos Partnership for all this. And uh, a big shout out to Hayes County and to uh, the uh, Salt Lake Barbecue guys, right? Uh, there in, in the Hayes County. My, uh, my uh, son-in-law is a facilities manager at the Salt Lake Barbecue, so I have a real uh, affinity for, uh, for that area, for the San, Greater, Greater San Marcos area. But uh, Mr. Wood, how are you doing today? I am I'm so. I am proud to be a civil engineer when I'm listening to all this stuff. I know I got it from uh, the, the school up the road in College Station, but you know, we're, <laughs> when we're in Texas, we're all part of one big family. So it's great to hear everything going on at the at Texas State, guys. Really impressive. I'll tell you, Pat. I am so excited to be here to. Uh, uh, present you with this award. Uh, we've got a little video that I'm going to have uh, Andreas tee up for about two minutes, but before we get into that, I just want to talk about uh, how uh, you had a just tremendous impact on my life that you may or may not fully understand, but to put that in a little context, I'm going to change my background here and bring in a couple of friends. Um, and uh, <laughs> and no I know the I know the one on the right, but that's Tom Freeman on the left. There you go. Yeah, Tom Freeman. I'm going. To... Uh oh, John, you're muted. John, you're muted. John, John, you're Come muted. On. Yeah. Nope. There you go. I'm gonna to explain to why why Tom Friedman uh, uh, is is in this this picture, but I uh, just transported. Uh, uh, via Zoom across the country. Uh, we're now standing in front of FERC, but uh, of course, prior to FERC, um, as you all know, Pat uh, had a legacy in Texas, and that legacy was with respect to um, the uh, restructuring of the markets in Texas. And uh, I had really no appreciation, uh, full appreciation for that. Uh, before I got to FERC. I, I got to FERC in 2006, and in August of 2006. And uh, in August of 2006, uh, that was uh, a time that I was wondering why I was there. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth, it was 90 degrees and 90% humidity and uh, concerned about being in a new environment because not only was it different for me to be at the federal level, I'd work primarily at the state level, but it was different to look into a structure of talking about wholesale markets and how they could be good for consumers. And I said at the time to people who asked me, reporters and others, that I was agnostic about markets. I really didn't know whether markets were good or bad. But um, Tom Friedman wrote a column in December of 2006, so about six months after I got to FERC, uh, about uh, uh, Pat Wood, who I had known Pat, but didn't know him that well at the time knew he was the former chairman of uh, 
of uh, FERC, but also former uh, chairman of the Texas Public Utilities Commission. But the column was about Pat and a transmission presentation he gave to uh, President Bush, who at the time was uh, governor of Texas in 1996. And it talked about how at the end of the presentation, George Bush came over to Pat and kind of whispered in his ear and said to Pat, you know, Pat, we like wind. So, uh, and Pat kind of looked around and said, uh, Mr. Governor, what? And yeah, we, we want to do something about wind, Pat. You need to go out and do something about wind. We like wind. And Pat went out and did something about wind. Pat created what was one of the first renewable portfolio standards in essence. They didn't call that that by that name in Texas, but in essence, that's what it was. It was what I call affirmative action for renewable, uh, renewable resources, and it was one of the first in the country. And so when I read this column by um, Tom Friedman, I thought, God, Pat Wood was cool before RPS was in place, man. He was, he was doing RPS before I was doing RPS in Nevada. This, I better pay attention to this guy. So I went back and read all this stuff on, on SMD, all this stuff, uh, standard market design, all the stuff that he'd done at FERC. And I'm, I'm going, this guy's right. This guy understands that consumers can benefit from markets, that it's going to work, and we got to do this. And that turned me around completely, wow. completely turned me around about what we need to do with respect to markets in this country. And so, you know, Pat has been an advocate for that, you know, from day one and was the one that was my inspiration to understand that if we want to have consumers have all these things that we're talking about end to end from a technology standpoint, we really need to support markets in this country. And the billions of dollars that we could have saved if Pat's SMD uh, that he wanted to put in place in 2001 had actually been put in place. And, you know, to his credit, you know, Texas is not having blackouts right now. We're having blackouts in California. So te obviously the markets in Texas are doing something right. You know, they're actually, actually working. And so I want to end this before we go to our video and say that, you know, aside from uh, the, his, unbelievable professional career you go google pat wood you know image of google images pat wood and the image you come up with is pat wood on a slide with his four sons so that tells you a lot about pat wood pat wood is a you know one of the salt of the earth uh, unbelievable family man and just somebody I love and I consider a, a brother and a colleague. So Pat, you know, let, let's go to the video, Andres, but I uh, can't think of anybody more deserving f to be inducted into the Digital 360 Hall of Fame. Thank you, Pat. Wow. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much. Wow. Born in Port Arthur, Texas, Pat Wood III has had a long career in energy. He is a former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, and the Public Utility Commission of Texas, PUCT. The son of a small businessman, Wood has always been a forceful advocate for replacing government-centered regulation with customer-focused, technology-unleashing competition. Wood holds a BS degree in civil engineering from Texas A&M University and a JD from Harvard Law School. He serves the executive board of Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star and the school board of trustees. He and his wife, Kathleen, are parents of four sons, and they are proud to call Houston home. Today, as CEO of Hunt Energy Network, Woods focuses on new power systems infrastructure and related business systems to integrate it into the competitive power market. Wood also serves as the lead independent director of integrated solar company SunPower and the director of utility construction firm Quanta Services. He has also served as board chairman of independent power producer Dynegy and the director of TPI Composites, among other companies. In 1995, Governor George W. Bush named Wood to head the PUCT with a mandate to free up power and telecommunication customers from monopoly utility control. The resulting restructured Texas Electric Market, ERCOT, is considered to be the most robustly competitive energy market in the country, with a high infrastructure investment, diverse service and technology offerings, and customer prices well below what they were under regulation. During his four years at the helm of FERC, under President George W. Bush, Wood led the responses to the 2000 through 2001 California energy crisis, the bankruptcy of Enron, and the 2003 North American power blackout. By 2005, over two-thirds of the country were served by the organized wholesale power markets that he championed. 
Under his leadership, FERC promoted the development of a cleaner and more competitive power generation fleet, significant natural gas infrastructure expansions, and a more robust power transmission grid, all in the context of well-ordered competitive energy markets. And it is for all of these reasons that we have selected Pat Wood III to be inducted into the Digital 360 Summit Hall of Fame. Yeah. Congratulations, Pat. And I, I, I got this uh, by mail, by the USPS mail. I should add, it works quite well and it delivers nicely and reliably. So don't believe what you read, folks. Uh, thank you. There, this is, um, wow, what a great, <laughs> you never know what a day will bring, but gosh, I, I can't top this one since uh, well before COVID started. Thank uh, you. know, first of all, Aggie getting an award from Texas State. I just got a mark today. That, that means a hell of a lot to me. And I'm deeply honored for that. And, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, as a civil engineer, I was particularly struck by the advances in concrete that Walt mentioned er earlier and, and many happy memories of uh, my uh, days in the concrete lab, which were followed almost within about six minute walk uh, by some beer at the Dixie Chicken across the street. But look at that state of the arts complex that, uh, well, he said it was civil engineering. I'll, I'll take it that uh, Stan pointed out it was a little broader than that, but uh, Steve pointed it out and how much engineering is changing and will continue to change. I'm, 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 uh, I'm lucky that I got in when, uh, when you could be a little dumber and it could, you could get through a little simpler than you do now. But, you know, my highlight right now is old Wellinghoff. I, I, I'm always told that, you know, in whatever job you are, you're only as good as who and what comes after you. And so, it's a double blessing to me that President Obama named him chairman on either his first or second day in office. And uh, John's customer-centered, tech-focused passion picked up and significantly upgraded uh, the, the agenda that I was following when I was there. Uh, I've got to say, I, I, uh, John's a card-carrying Democrat, but I am super damn proud that he was a George W. Bush appointee to that commission. And it does underscore really the bipartisan nature of energy and not just energy, but you know, y'all a real template for so many other issues in our country and in our world. Um, it's really gotten so out of control, but I think it's important to remember that this collaboration, which really the FERC, the FERC alumni group, uh, we're, we're, we've continued that collaboration today advocating against bailouts for uneconomic power plants and sticking together on issues that just really bind us as people that care about the country and not not as partisan Democrats or Republicans. So John, I um, hope today is a good snapshot for people who are looking for something to believe in because it's the world we lived in at FERC and it's a world that can come back to the country. So on this conference, what a great uh, tagline it has, digitization, decarbonization, decentralization. And I think I wanted to add, as I was listening to, to, to y'all talk and thinking about all this, I wanna add another DE, which is democratization. Not Democratic Party, but people. The yeah. democratic part of, of this energy industry, which has been monopoly for our whole life and is, to be, to be fair, has done a, a, a very good job in creating one of the great power engines of the world, which is the, you know, Northern America integrated power system is a humongous achievement. Um, but to take that democratization angle and, and bring it back for me, uh, one story before that one that John related very well, thank you for finding Tom Friedman's article. That was a fun field trip for me. I was chairman of an advisory board for Irish wind developer called Airtricity. When I left FERC, I didn't want to work for anybody I'd regulated. So I got all the way out there, met this Irish guy who was charismatic as hell and told me um, he wanted me to uh, help him, uh, you know, figure out the, the U.S. market. So I, I came across Tom and just sent an email to him, just unbidden. He goes, oh, I've heard of you. I'm going to come out there. And sure enough, you know, people say, hey, and you say, come on by. And, you know, that, like Southern people do, just come over and we'll have some. Well, hell, he says, I'm coming. And so I set up the trip for him to Midland. We fly out there, go to Big Spring, and just talk through what it is, what's involved in building a uh, wind farm in Texas. This would have been about 06, as, as 
John pointed out. But a little bit before that was when Bush got elected in early 05, he sat down in his office and, and told me, Pat, utilities care more about what we, meaning the governor and the Senate and the legislature, what we think than what their customers think. And that's wrong. And we're going to change that. Get to a market. So that was uh, his, he's kind of incomparable in the four word commands. You'll, you'll hear a couple others I'll relate in a sec, but um, so we did. We got a good wholesale competition bill in 1995. We set up the ERCOT independent system operator, the nation's first, and got going into this new model. Um, as as um, John related a year later, as I was leaving Bush's office, he said, Pat, we like wind. And of course, like uh, I said, what? He said, get smart on it. So we did, we did this neat process pioneered by the uh, Dr. Fishkin up at University of Texas up the road and taken by Ross Perot when he was running in 92 and trying to do road trips to educate people, not just ask them a poll number in the mall and keep them and they keep on walking, but to bring them in for a couple of days, educate them on all sides of an issue in big groups and then have small breakout groups. I got to actually see a lot of those breakout groups because we had 14 of these around the state of Texas over the next two years as we were getting smart on it, as the governor told, told us to do. And we got real customer input into utility decisions um, in this kind of era of transition from a regulated environment to a deregulated environment. And so the, it was fun to sit through and, and have monitors of one-way discussions. I got to see it through the one-way glass. I got to much, much like a perp inside of a, a jail gets to, you get to see somebody watch them. I got to watch all these great people just reacting to the to the information they they done and to hear it raw, to hear raw Texans talk away about what they heard and what they really think. And what was, I think, uh, seminal in my professional life was the takeaway that came out of that process, which was that Texans of every broad nature, um, from Beaumont to Amarillo, we even had a meeting in Shreveport to pick up some of the uh, Northeast Texas folks in uh, South Swepco, uh, down to Brownsville. We have, I think it was Brownsville, Harlingen, El Paso, of course, Austin, all the big cities, but uh, a lot of the smaller ones as well, but had a great breakout that Texans cared a lot more about energy efficiency and renewable energy, even if it came with an uh, assumed to have come with a higher cost uh, than we ever dreamed. And so I reported back to the boss and I got another one of those four word phrases, I told you so, um, get the job finished. And so that's what we did in getting a, a comprehensive bipartisan restructuring bill in 1999 passed, it was Senate Bill 7. I had the joy for the next two years of actually implementing the letter and the spirit of that law. But like Moses, I only got to see the promised land, not walk into it because Bush asked me to come up to FERC uh, to quote, clean up the mess in the California Western US power market, energy market meltdown. It was a natural gas and electric energy just, just road crash that really uh, set back the competitive market model for 20 years. It's been in fact happening again this week for perhaps different reasons, but uh, in any event, uh, that was part of my job was to be on defense, which was unusual after six years of being in offense in Austin. But um, he also directed me to continue that drive to open up the nation to competitive power markets, just like FERC had done in the natural gas market under his father. And so uh, standard market design, which John was kind of referred to, was my attempt to take the Texas model nationwide and uh, ended up getting pushed back from uh, the strong monopoly regions of the country in the deep southeast and in the non-California West, where there's a lot of distrust of uh, the federal government. Um, and so I, that's fair. I mean, I, I live in that world and I had to adapt to it. But uh, nonetheless, we did it piecemeal and got about two thirds of the country in, that, in, the, in the competitive power model. And so I'd give myself a C minus for that work. But uh, I do have to say back to the A, the A effort down here in Texas, one of the seemingly small aspects of Senate Bill 7, which again was that 1999 restructuring law, was a re the renewable energy portfolio standard. And John, we actually did call it that in the statute, believe it or not, 
uh, before those terms became so politically laden, we were <laughs> happy to call things what they actually were, which are, you've got to get 2000 megawatts more of new renewable energy in the next 10 years, Texas. PUC, go figure out how to do it. So that was part of the big old bipartisan welcome mat that Texas threw out to the clean energy pioneers around the world. And in they have come. Uh, in 20 years, we have added over 13 times that 1999 renewable energy goal. It makes me <laughs> recognize I shouldn't go into the crystal ball business because we thought 2000 was a hard stretch and it ended up, we ended up closing, closing in on 26,000, mostly wind and then on the more recent years, solar energy, uh, altogether making us the fifth most, uh, fifth largest country in the world for clean energy and the, on the electric power system. So, you know, I'd love to say y'all that this was all part of some master plan but it was really a whole lot more basic than that. Um, a regulator doing his job has got to keep two things in mind. One is that economic development. You, Jason, I listened to your presentation about the, the greater San Marcos area. It's absolutely that on the statewide level for us as regulators. You have got to be focused on jobs. And then second job as a regulator is to uh, make sure the little guy is not getting screwed over. It's the anti-discrimination aspect of the uh, regulatory statutes, not too different from the ones that we have for, you know, treating people different on the way that they look. Um, you know, we've got that on the power side as well. And the wind energy industry in, in the late 90s was a prime example of that. Um, as to economic development, if you can make money and provide jobs off of it, heck, that's what we like here in Texas. And the Lord has blessed us with a whole lot of wind and the solar resource. And as to anti-discrimination, wind energy was a new player in the power market whose rules were written long ago for coal and nuclear and gas, big power plants in different parts of the, of the grid. So my main job as a regulator was to make sure that the new guy had a seat at the poker table. And so, you know, the non-discrimination, don't just don't screw the little guy or the new technology in this case. And there ended up being not just at a big level, but a lot of little small things that we overturned that found that we found when we threw the big welcome mat out, there was a lot of little things that were keeping that welcome mat from being a really secure one. So I would say that certainly uh, on my watch and, 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 and the wonderful team that Governor Perry and since then Governor Abbott have put on the commission since then have been very focused on the same things and make sure that the welcome mat to, to at that time win, but to all technologies is lasting and deep. Uh, I have to say that, that regulatory continuity is, is very underappreciated, but you know, John and I have lived in that world for a while and having that continuity is so important because you see when we, you don't have it, which has happened uh, in, at the FERC and elsewhere, when you've got the discontinuities, it really makes people stand back and go, I can't invest money there. So people did invest money here. Today, renewable energy is cheaper than gas or coal or nuclear, even if you don't subsidize it. And so it's the economic choice. Um, and a large slug of it is now in our statewide resource stack, benefiting all of us who are probably patched in here today. And is a big reason that our power rates have dropped over 50% adjusted for inflation since we opened up the market to both renewable energy and retail customer competition in 2001. I'm yeah. pleased with, I'm pleased that um, Texans of all stripes who keep up with this are really pretty proud of the mostly market driven renaissance in Texas that's cleaned up our grid faster and cheaper than everywhere else. It's proven that the world's best testing laboratory for innovation and energy technology entrepreneurs business plans is here. And I do think at the end of the day, a customer driven green policy is and will be quicker, more effective and more cost effective than one that's uh, shut down and is top down. So I just want to say, um, Andres, and thank you and John and the rest of the team for giving me the honor of following John into the Digital 360 Hall of Fame. Um, I ain't done yet. So I look forward to bringing the honor back to you for giving it to me. So thanks again. And uh, this is a, uh, it's hard to see with the reflections there, but uh, it's pretty glass and it means a lot. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all very much.
You're, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat. So, so while before I let you both go, I have a I have a quickly something that I have I've, I've shared with John a little bit, and I want to get your feedback or take on it. As we move forward, Pat and John, and things accelerate, everybody talks about the technology side of innovation, new business models, but it seems to be, seems to me, that the larger opportunity or the lower big hanging fruit is the innovation that needs to happen on the policy side, on the regulatory side, to really maybe even catch up with all this innovation as we are you know, into electric vehicles, energy storage everywhere. So what are you, what's your take on, the, on that element and how do, we, how do we accelerate things on the policy side? What could happen? What should happen? Well, it looks like John's frozen. So I will, I, I think the collaboration that happens, you know, clearly at things like this, getting the, getting the, the regulators, legislators involved. I mean, clearly they drive a lot here, even in a low government state like Texas, you know, making sure really that that relentless uh, rooting out of uh, barriers to entry. I, I would say that's probably one thing I got really good at and I wasn't smarter than anybody else, but I, I was pretty good at sniffing out if somebody was trying to block uh, somebody else from coming in. And so sometimes that's not intentional, it's not mean, it's just the system was designed for different technologies. And so when you look, you look at the things that we're doing here uh, in the other parts of the conference, it's a wonderful agenda for the next days, but you know, there's a lot of things there that weren't thought of 20 years ago, much less a century ago. And so, you it's not that you're overtly being blocked from trying something. It's that there people just say, Oh, it, it might impact reliability. That's always the trump card of the, of the last bastion of, of, of just say no crowd in the power industries. It'll make the lights go off. Well, you know, gosh, the downside of that's pretty high as we're seeing yesterday in California, but you know, you, you got to push forward with rooting out those places where, that technology can't be implemented. And um, it, it's, it's tough work uh, because you're taking on uh, vested interests that have a lot of money sunk into an older paradigm. Um, you know, in some cases, subsidies are involved. So you're not only taking on the interest, but you're taking on the government person supporting that interest. So that's why I'm a big believer that subsidies, while sometimes important on the front end of a revolution, need to go away. I mean, 10 years, 15 max on any of these things is probably good enough. And so you want to just, again, make sure that uh, nobody gets too comfortable. And so whether it's this technology being replaced by something your guys are inventing there in the labs at Texas State, um, make them just as hungry once they win as they are hungry today. Uh, and that kind of system is what's made America really a phenomenal country for innovation. Yeah. John? Well, and another thing we do, I mean, you're absolutely right, Pat, but another thing we absolutely have to do, I think, is <clears throat> do the analysis and make it transparent to consumers of what the um, impacts to them economically and financially are going to be if we do this end to end thing that you're talking about, you know, and in, in, in the in the electricity world, we're talking about from the distribution side and all the consumer um, resources behind the meter that can be used in front of the meter and integrated across the whole spectrum. If we can show uh, consumers what the benefits to them are from doing that. I mean, for example, when I was at FERC, we got uh, a number of the state commissions together, including uh, the Texas Commission, uh, Arkansas, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, that were all interested in what Entergy was doing at the time, very concerned about Entergy's activities and wanted to know whether or not consumers would be benefited if Entergy joined a wholesale market. Well, I put up $500,000 from FERC or out of my FERC budget to do a study that showed if Entergy would be moved into a wholesale organized 
market and dispatched on a economic dispatch basis, the consumers in the energy footprint would save $700 million. We published that study. Immediately, all the state commissions told then the energy um, you know, executives, you are going to go into an organized wholesale market. And so you know, the, the power of unleashing that information to consumers should not be overlooked. And we need to do more of that, I think. Great point. That's a great point, Mr. Prefer. Well, gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough uh, for being the two pillars of the Digital 360 Summit Hall of Fame. We're <laughs> delighted to have you. Uh, and uh, we um, look forward to being bound together for life as we <laughs> move forward and opportunities will arise on what we're doing down here in the little, little San Marcos. So come and see us soon and hopefully uh, next year when we have the conference, the, you will have a significant task, which will be to select the third person. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I look forward to getting to, to walk through the lab. I was looking forward to seeing uh, all the work that was going on by the students and the researchers there. So uh, uh, we'll have twice as much to look at next year. Absolutely. And, and before, yeah, I, I, before I sign off, I, uh, I would be remiss not to ask Dr. Horton if he has any comments or final questions or thoughts. No, um, just again, a wonderful, wonderful opening panel, and I know a lot more to come in the, in the summit, and I will be tuning in, Andreas. Uh, congratulations, Pat. It was an honor meeting you virtually, and I look forward to meeting you in person. And John, thank you for you know your wonderful work as well. And uh, Andreas, thank you. Good job, man. You can you can keep your, you can keep your job for a while. <laughs> Steve, Steve, any final thoughts, comments? You're good. You're good. Stan, anything? All right. Well, Dr. Horton summed it up. Let's let's send it away. Thank you, gentlemen. Great to, great to see you again. Congratulations. Thank you for uh, launching the Digital 360 Summit today. All the best. We will start broadcasting now. Uh, if you want to stick around for two more.